Good morning, Gateway Bible Church. Uh, please turn in your scriptures, if you will, to Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 27. Uh, as we continue in our sermon series, now, Destiny Revealed. Would you bow your heads with me in reverence to our God who is going to bless us and, and show us the reason that we have assembled here this morning? Father, uh, we are so in awe of your grace and your mercy as we just sang. And um, Lord, we ask now that you would reign here in our hearts, that you would, um, through your Holy Spirit, just illuminate these verses in our hearts, minds, and souls so that we can know what it is that we're to take away from here today, what it is that we are to apply to our life, how it is that we can change into more of the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ, with each passing day. And we thank you that you provide us with this opportunity to come before you in your word. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> the uh, sermon title for this morning is, You Don't Need a, a Sign. You Need New Eyes. You don't need a sign. You need new eyes. So let's, let, me, let me explain what that means. As I am preparing this week, um, I was reflecting on the, the verses that the Lord has me teaching. And um, I got to share something with you, if you don't know, and that is that my eyes are getting weaker. My eyes are getting weaker. At about age 50, as most of us will, I began to require uh, reading glasses to see. Now, just for a, with a show of hands, can anybody relate? Maybe that happened a little bit earlier. Maybe that happened a little bit later in your life. I struggled because I did not want to admit to myself that my eyes were not perfect anymore. Um, Somehow, the glasses made me feel weaker. And so I struggled. In fact, there's people sitting in here today who um, witnessed some of that struggle. Right, Linda? Um, so I had a problem because a pastor is not only in the nurturing business and the shepherding business. He's also in the reading and the writing and the speaking business. And it was the reading and the writing part that was getting more and more difficult. So the solution, of course, was very simple. I had to get new eyes. New eyes. Now, I did that like most people do by simply going to the nearest department store and availing myself of those cheap reading glasses that you can find uh, almost anywhere. Uh, I told myself the reason that I couldn't see properly was because of the lack of light. So what I would do is take my books, and I'm in the books all week long, you know, because I like my books. I don't have the computer where you can increase the font size and those kind of things. So I like my books and I have a little desk lamp on my desk and I take my books and I put it right underneath the uh, light bulb from that lamp. Uh, but the reality is I did not need more light. I needed better eyes. And once I got over my pride and began using my reading glasses regularly, guess what? I could see just fine. Uh, and as I was preparing this week for the lesson, I, I was struck at the message, the, the irony of Jesus when he says, when your eyes are good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eyes are bad, your body also is full of darkness. The reality is this, we don't need more light 
to see Jesus, we need better eyes. Amen? Spiritual eyes. And Jesus is going to show us in these next verses exactly what that looks like. It begins in verse 27 where he is forced to respond to a, to a woman that interrupts him while he's teaching. It says in verse 27, And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, Jesus said, Well, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Wow. Let's understand all of this in context. Jesus is in the middle of a very lengthy and profound discourse. That's started uh, at the beginning of Luke chapter 11. It covered such very lofty things as the Lord's Prayer. Remember, how to pray, that's pretty big. It covered Jesus requiring us to keep asking and to keep seeking, and to keep knocking. And, and just before this woman interrupted, he was exhorting the crowd to choose, the necessity to choose between good and evil. Light and darkness, Jesus and the kingdom of Satan. Now, in the middle of this teaching, woman shouts out, blessed is the womb that uh, bore you. This woman is obviously moved. She's moved by how clear and how compelling the teaching of Jesus Christ is. But what is she doing? She wants to glorify Jesus' mother Mary and give her this credit for this great wisdom and great teaching that she is now experiencing. In short, she's saying, what a marvelous person your mother must be. How wonderful to be your mother. You know, humans love symbols. And we love monuments. And in this case, the monument that is being erected by this woman is this sort of enthusiastic praise to Jesus' biological mother, Mary. Yeah, but with Jesus, compliments are not in order. Jesus does not require any kind of superficial reaction, any kind of compliments uh, to show discernment in Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us here that it is better to have a spiritual, spiritual relationship with him than a biological one. Amen? And here we come to a really important truth that Jesus delivers here in these verses, and that is hearing and doing the word of God is our highest priority. After all, he says this in John chapter 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. To hear the word of God coming from Jesus and to respond to that word of God with obedience, that's the spiritual connection that Jesus desires. Amen? Amen? Even when it comes to his mother. Wow. Now, he says that the relationship that is uh, possible with him should be the most important relationship that we can ever experience. More important than the relationship that we might experience with our spouse. More important than the relationship that we can experience with our children. Even more important than the relationship that we can experience with our mom, with our mother. Now, remember this, biological relationships were extremely important in that day. 
remember the whole nation took great pride that they were uh, descendants of Abraham. As a matter of fact, in that same passage in the book of John, Jesus is teaching them that um, if they would receive the truth of him, of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, that they would be set free. And this is what they replied to, how they replied to Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 33. They answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say uh, you will be made free? So that connection, that biological connection was extremely important. Now, Jesus has harsh words for those who desire to set up monuments and for those who um, seek or uh, would seek a sign. And they and Jesus says they will be given a sign. But the only sign they will be given is the sign of Jonah. Look what it says in John chapter. Uh, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 11, verse 29. It says, and while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Now, in verse 16, they're testing Jesus yet again, this time by demanding a sign. And Jesus calls them an evil generation for demanding these signs in the first place. They're evil, Jesus says, because they don't have that honest desire to really know, to apprehend the truth. They're blind. They're spiritually blind to the obvious fact that God is working through the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, it might be helpful to some just to um, realize what a sign is. And a sign is simply a, a confirming miracle that shows that the message that is being delivered at the moment is true. Does that make sense? A sign is just a confirming miracle. Now, in other words, the crowd is not going to believe Jesus's message without some kind of external confirmation. Maybe you know people like that. They wanted something profound. They wanted something awesome. They wanted something sensational. They wanted a sign from heaven. They wanted uh, the constellations in the sky to change place at night before their eyes. They wanted Taurus to merge with uh, Orion. They wanted gold letters emblazoned across the heavens. And this, by the way, is exactly what Satan tried to get Jesus to do back in the temptation. Perform one of these miraculous signs, Satan says to Jesus, and what? They will love you. They will follow you. At that moment, they will hear your message. Remember what Satan says? Luke 4, 9. Luke says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, that Satan brought Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. And remember what would happen? Jesus, uh, Satan says the angels will come. They'll catch you before you hit the ground. It will be a sign to everybody. And it would be at that moment that your mission could start, that people would start following you. Now, so what does Jesus do? He says, this is an evil gener generation. To say that these people are evil, to say that these people are wicked, this is an understatement because why, you ask? Because we must remember that at the time they are demanding a sign, at that very moment, Jesus had just performed a miracle, the casting out of a demon. 
at that very moment when they're demanding a, a sign. Jesus had performed all kinds of miracles. He had healed people visibly, extended people's arms. He demon expulsion. He even raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Sign after sign after sign. Jesus' teaching was marvelous. It was obvious that he was fulfilling prophecy, sign after sign after sign. And so it's not surprising that our Lord refuses to give uh, these people any more signs. His response is what? There will be no sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, what is the sign of Jonah the prophet? Jonah was swallowed up by the sea monster, the, the big fish, the well, for three days. And so Jesus would be swallowed up by the earth. That's the sign. In due time, Christ would give them the correct sign, the sign that says, I am victorious over death and over sin. That will be enough sign, Jesus says. So jo Jonah becomes this type of Christ, this type of, of our Lord Jesus. Just as Jonah came back from the dead, Christ will be raised from the dead and he will be victorious. And Jesus says, uh, this would be the generation that Jonah uh, is speaking to as well. Just as Jonah had spoken to the Ninevites, that kind of preaching, there's something greater here right now. The sign of Jonah is also the sign of Jonah's preaching. Now, remember what happened. You know the story of Jonah, right? How he, how he is called by God to go in one direction, but he goes in the opposite direction. His mission was what? Go to this superpower pagan city who is incredibly, incredibly hostile and vicious, Walk into the city, don't ride, don't do anything. Walk in through the city gates, go in down to the middle of the street and start preaching. Start preaching that they needed to repent. And if they didn't repent, God's judgment would fall on them. And so why is Jesus making this comparison? Because they believed Jonah's preaching without any external confirmation. So he says something very similar is going on here. And Jesus gives us another truth here um, found in these verses, and that is faith is not the result of special proofs. Faith is not the result of special proofs. Now, I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I get someone coming up to me that would say, you know, Pastor Wayne, I would believe in God if what? I could just get a sign. Have you ever heard that in your life? If I could just see a sign. But the reality is that um, if people do not respond to the clear call found in God's word, they're not going to respond to these external signs. Remember what Jesus says in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. Jesus says, if they do not hear, if they do not hear, if they do not hear Moses, which is a lot of books of the Old Testament, and the prophets, which is all of the books basically of the Old Testament, Neither are they going to be persuaded, even if somebody rises from the dead. Wow. Wow. Sign seekers have problems, Jesus says. Now, in verse 31, he has to remind them that, again, that someone greater than Jonah is here. Look what it says in verse 31. Jesus says, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. 
And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment and this generation uh, with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, uh, greater than Jonah is him. Jesus says for those who refuse him, there will be a judgment. And in that judgment, it will include the pagans, the pagans that that uh, believe the wisdom of Solomon, the, the pagans that believed the preaching of the Gentiles, these Gentile, the Queen of Sheba and the uh, and, and the prophet, the, the, the Gentiles that believe from Nineveh, the uh, prophet Jonah. Now, wow, why? Why the judgment? Because they failed to discern that someone greater than those two examples is standing right before them. And so Jesus' words about the queen of the south, it lends much to this interpretation. You remember the story. It comes from 1 Kings chapter 10. The queen of the south is a reference to the queen of Sheba. And the queen of Sheba comes to Jerusalem with a very large entourage, a very large retinue. And she comes to Jerusalem to see King Solomon because she had heard of his unimaginable wisdom and she comes bearing camels and spices and all of this gold and she wants to test Solomon's wisdom she's she wants to prove Solomon's wisdom by asking him a series of some very intense questions and all of those questions by Solomon are answered perfectly and she's ultimately satisfied and she goes home. So Jesus is saying the pagan queen of Sheba, she journeys from the end of the uh, earth to hear the wisdom of King Solomon. And she reacted to what she heard. She didn't require any external signs, any external confirmation or anything like that. And he has to remind them that was pretty great, but something greater is even uh, standing before you right now. So the point is clear. The generation that is listening to Jesus' words, they didn't have as much faith as some of these Gentiles that had listened to the words of God previously. Therefore, the Gentiles would be standing up with Jesus during this generation's judgment. Now, here's the third truth I want us to apprehend from these verses. God's judgment will be according to opportunity, Jesus says. Because some people stand in the full light of the revelation of Jesus Christ more than others. They have been exposed to that light more than others, and yet they still, what? They still reject it. And those people are going to be more accountable on the day of judgment, Jesus says, than these others. Now, the reality is, don't think for one second that you're going to uh, stand before the Lord on judgment day after you have rejected his provision, his reconciliation, his his, his offering of his son to bring you to him. Don't think for a moment that you're going to be able to say, Lord, I, 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 I didn't have enough proof. I didn't have enough proof, Lord. Uh, Lord, there wasn't enough light for me to see. Lord, you never gave me the opportunity. Jesus makes it clear that will, that cannot and will not be the case. Now, we have the light. Amen? Amen. And in verse 33, Jesus says that we should share that light that he is providing. Look what it says in verse 33. Jesus says no one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. This is simply a continuation of what Jesus has been saying. Someone greater than Solomon is here. 
My wisdom is greater than any human wisdom. Because they had been listening to God himself, they had the light shining on them. And so the question becomes, what do we do with this light? What do we do with it? To us, is it supernatural? Is it compelling? So that it becomes the light and the joy of our lives. Jesus is talking about sight. He's talking about seeing. And now he starts to begin, he, now he begins by, by giving us a, a parable of two lamps. Two lamps. What do we know about lamps? Here's, here's the fourth truth I want us to apprehend. Lamps, and I know this is very simple, but lamps are designed for one thing and one thing only. What is it? To shine. Jesus says we are lamps and that we have one purpose and it's to shine. Now this is the truth. This is the truth that Jesus has given us. He says, I have set a lamp in the world. My wise, my powerful presence. Nobody greater is standing before you, he says. John chapter 8, look what Jesus says. Verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus says, I am the light. I am the lamp, and I should not be missed. I am the light that should be apprehended, should be acquired. And once you have that light, what? Share it. Share that light. We are to share the light of Jesus Christ. And more than that, in verse 34, Jesus says, make sure you are full of that light. Look what he says in verse 34. Jesus says, the lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light. As when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Wow. Make sure that you are full of light. So now here's that second lamp parable, right? Jesus compares the lamp to the eyes of the body. And he compares them to both healthy eyes and he, par and he compares it to diseased eyes. Healthy eyes do what? They illumine, they illuminate. Diseased eyes, they darken, they distort. And Jesus saying that there is an ultimate tragedy, it's spiritual blindness. And that spiritual blindness will darken everything. By contrast, if the eyes of our soul are healthy, what happens? Everything is illuminated. And Jesus is God's light for all to see. Amen? Uh, you can be physically blind. Jesus says. But he also says, much more importantly, you can be spiritually blind. Just as a physically blind person must move around in darkness, the light is of no use to a, to a blind person because the eyes are not functioning. So the spiritually blind person is moving around in darkness and is kept from seeing the light. Now, if our spiritual eyes, however, admit the light of Jesus Christ, what happens? Jesus says, we will live entirely in the light. So I want to ask you a question. Are the people that Jesus is speaking to, the ones who are demanding a sign, is it the lack of evidence that makes them demand a sign? 
or is it their blindness which makes them demand a sign from heaven? Sign seekers claim that they need more light in order to see. Amen? Just like your pastor with faulty eyes who thought if he just read in, in two inches away from a light bulb, everything would be fine. Sign seekers claim they need more light, but their problem isn't they, that they need more light. What do they need? They need new eyes. Sign seekers close their eyes to the light and extra light is not going to help their condition. Amen. It just won't happen. So in verse 35, Jesus says this, take heed that the light that is within you is not darkness. Wow. In other words, Jesus says there is a lot of stuff in the world that might come through those eyeballs that is passing itself off as light. And you know, there are many bright things in the world that keep us from seeing the true light of Christ. There are many things in the world that keep us from seeing the true light of Christ. I liken it to when you go outside at night in front of your house in a rather uh, urban area, walk out on the street and look up. What do you see? Not very much. Have you done it lately? Go outside of your apartment, of your house, of your tent, or whatever it is around here, look up at the sky, and you're going to see four or five things. It's just the way it is. Now, you go at that same moment, and you drive up here 45 minutes to the top of Mount Pinos, which is 80-something hundred feet, and I guarantee you that that sky is ridiculously and enormously different. Amen. Have any of you ever done that? Does anybody feel me? You know, what, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about wonder. I'm talking about awe. I'm talking about weird science fiction stuff. Stuff moving across the sky that you couldn't see. Some of it man-made. Some of it uh, celestial. Stars falling. It's constellations that you didn't even know existed. Billions of stars. That's the difference. So Jesus says what? Take heed. Take heed. This is the severe warning that Jesus offers us here in this chapter. And this is the fifth truth that he offers us as well. Be careful what you see, Jesus is saying. Be careful what you think is bright and attractive and compelling. Why? Because if it's not the light of Jesus Christ you are filled with, Jesus says you are filled with darkness. No matter how bright and shiny the object that you are looking at at that moment appears. My goodness. Jesus Christ is the glory that you and I are designed are designed to see. Amen? His light alone should fill us with the light of life, the light of purpose, the light of meaning. And when we are filled with that light, we ourselves become what? Lamps. And we are shining the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus says the whole body will be full of light and when the bright, sh as like a, like a bright shining lamp that gives off light. Now, by this point in the Gospel of Luke, there should be no, no doubt that uh, the light which we are able to comprehend is directly proportionate to the condition of our hearts. That is what Jesus is ultimately talking about here. Our hearts, the condition of our heart. What is it exactly in our hearts that uh, darkens that light within us? That's the question we must ask. What about our hearts that is enabled to snuff out that uh, light? Well, I'm gonna give you two reasons. Two things that make that possible. Number one, 
our hearts can become hard. Amen? Maybe some of you in here today, even if you're a believer and lover of Jesus Christ, your heart has become hard. As it turns out, our hearts can get calluses. I've had them before in my life. Doing pretty good right now, thank you. But I've had them before in my life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You get calluses. What, ha what are calluses? Calluses are, 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 are irritations on the skin that arise because you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. You're doing something that's irritating. Who gets calluses? Has anybody ever got calluses in here before? Guitar players. I've heard that, that you're supposed to have calluses, right? Now, that might be good for guitar players, but it's certainly not good in the kingdom of Jesus Christ and our ability to ascertain and shine the light of Jesus Christ. Amen? The reality is, if we repeat that action long enough, the skin becomes hardened. And what used to hurt us, what used to hurt us, we can do now without even blinking. And so it is with our hearts. The first time we do something wrong, we experience a corresponding shiver. Our heart actually aches a little bit. But each time we repeat that sin, our heart aches a little less. We shiver less. And finally, you get to the point where you can do that Wrong thing, that sin with absolutely uh, no hesitation, no anxiety, no shivering, no aching, because the calluses are there. And finally, you realize that sin is a horrible, horrible, fossilizing phenomena. Your heart becomes hard. No person ever took that first step down the pathway of sin without alarm bells going off in their heart. And if you continue down that pathway, what's happened? You have to ignore those alarm bells. And when you, and, and when you repeat that sin long enough, the ultimate, the ultimate uh, manifestation is you just don't care. Wow. When what we were once shivering at and aching over has now become a habit and we have nobody to blame but ourselves. Amen. Second possibility why the heart become dark. They lose that light. The illumination of Jesus Christ is they, they simply might be rebellious. Hearts can be rebellious things. It's quite possible to know the right way, but take the wrong way. There was a somebody named Jonah that Jesus offers up as an example for that. You can feel God's hand on your shoulder, amen? But you can also shrug it off. You can shrug it off. That is ultimately what Jesus is speaking about right here. The light that we can apprehend, the light that we possess, the light that we shine, ultimately is reflective of the condition of our hearts. And what's the remedy? We pray. We pray to Jesus Christ, we're going to do it right now, that he would make our hearts soft and supple, receptive, good soil. Amen? Uh, would you close your Bibles with me now?